This video is part of the series to accompany discrete mathematics and functional programming. I'm Thomas Van Drunen. In this video, we introduce a miscellany of set concepts. Now that you have the basic idea of a set and the notation for expressing facts about sets. Namely, we are going to introduce cardinality, disjointedness, partitions, and Cartesian products. These set concepts will be important later on as raw material for proof exercises and, more to the point, as machinery for capturing more sophisticated ideas in both math and computer science. That is, some important definitions and theorems that we'll look at later on will rely on the concepts that we're introducing here. You should note that in these sections we'll tend to give informal descriptions to give you an intuitive feel for these things. We'll revisit them later in the course once we have the tools of symbolic logic to express them formally. Since at this point we're interested only in an informal acquaintance with these terms, those of you who know them from earlier math experiences can safely skip this video and skim the relevant sections in the book. I'm going to assume that all these terms are new to you. Let's start by looking at a handful of tree species drawn from a universal set of tree species, as we can see in this diagram. We can categorize these in several ways. We can categorize them by division, so conifers versus angiosperms, also called broadleafs, by deciduous trees versus evergreens, by which species are found naturally in Illinois, or we can uh, categorize them by genus. The first term for today is cardinality. To put it plainly, the cardinality of a set is the number of elements in it. The cardinality of the set I is 6. Of course, the set I isn't the set of all tree species found in Illinois. We mean just the subset displayed here. The cardinality of set X, which is standing for the uh, cypress species, or in fact there's only one cypress species that we're talking about today, and so the cardinality of set X is 1. The cardinality of set E, that is the evergreen species in, uh, under our discussion right presently, is 3. And the cardinality of the set I minus E is 5. The cardinality of the set X minus I is 0. We denote cardinality by enclosing the representation of a set with vertical bars. And by representation of a set, we can mean either the symbolic name of a set, such as X, or some other expression that indicates a set, such as X minus I. We determine the cardinality of a set simply by counting them. That's our informal definition. But we'll find that when we get around to defining cardinality formally, which is not until section 7.9, we'll still essentially use counting to capture the idea of cardinality. It's just that composing that process formally is surprisingly tricky. Now, what about the cardinality of infinite sets, like integers and real numbers and the other number sets we talked about in section 1? Well, for now, we won't define cardinality for them. To clarify, We'll say the cardinality of a finite set is the number of elements in that set. So resist the temptation to say that a set has cardinality infinity. Eventually, we will talk about the cardinality of infinite sets. And when we do, we'll see that it doesn't really make sense to say that a set's cardinality is infinity. For now, we simply say that the set is infinite. Next term. Two sets are disjoint if they have no elements in common. That is, their intersection is the empty set. Alternately, you could say their cardinality is zero. The set of maples and the set of evergreens are disjoint. Again, we're just talking about the species listed here. There, in fact, does exist at least one maple species that is evergreen, but we're not talking about that species in this discussion. Angiosperms and evergreens are not disjoint, as live oaks are an example of an evergreen broadleaf. The set of deciduous trees and the set of conifers are not disjoint, as 
bald cedars are an example of deciduous conifers. While we're on this example, note that if you pick any three sets shown here and intersect all three, you get the empty set. Obviously, the intersection of all four together is likewise empty. Which raises the question, what does disjointedness mean for more than two sets? We still can say that, for example, angiosperms, evergreens, and conifers are disjoint since the total overlap of the three is empty. But a more useful notation is that of pairwise disjointness. This captures the idea of a collection of sets, none of which have any overlap with each other. The sets shown here are not pairwise disjoint, since several of them have overlaps. On the other hand, if we look again at the sets indicating genera, that is, we have the maples, the cypresses, or the cypress, pines, and oaks, we see four sets that, as a collection, are pairwise disjoint. Any two that you pick are disjoint. One use of the idea of pairwise disjoint is in defining what's called a partition. Two things to watch out for here. First, what we're defining requires an extra level of abstraction because a partition is itself a set. In fact, a set of sets. Second, the name partition may seem misplaced at first. A partition of a set is a set of subsets of that set, as in the case here, the sets M, X, P, and Q as subsets of T, such that two conditions hold. First, all sets are pairwise disjoint. No two have a non-empty overlap with each other. Second, their union makes up the entire set. The sets shown here make a partition of the set of tree species we've been talking about. Every species that we have been talking about is in one of these three sets. In fact, is in exactly one of these three sets. So the four sets all together cover the entire set of species we've been talking about, and they have no overlaps. Thus, they make a partition. Now, when I first encountered the idea of a partition as a student, it struck me that partitioning might be a better name than partition. But partition is what we have. You can see section 1.8 in the text for more examples of these. But for the moment, turn your attention to the following questions, which are based on exercises 1.8.2 through 4. First, notice that if we take the set of evergreens and subtract out the conifers, we get the set containing just live oak. If we subtract the evergreens out of the set of conifers, we get the set containing just bald cypress. Those two sets are disjoint. Now that was a specific case. Is it true in general that for sets A and B, that A minus B and B minus A are disjoint? Well, I can tell you the answer. It is true in general. See if you can formulate an intuitive explanation why that is so. And better than that, demonstrate it is true using Venn diagrams. Second question. If we take the union of maples and oaks, we get a set with cardinality 5. We notice that that's the same as the sum of the cardinalities of the two sets we unioned. What do you think? Is it true in general that the cardinality of the union of the two sets is equal to the sum of the cardinalities? Assume we're dealing with finite sets here. Again, I'll tell you the answer. No. This is not always true. Your challenge is to think of an example, that is, a set A and B from the same universe for which this set equation does not hold. So really, that would be finding a counterexample. One way to attack that problem is to think about what is special about the sets we chose to make the equation work. Your counterexample will have to have two sets that don't have the special property that maples and oaks have together. Finally, what about this one? Conifers minus cypresses gives us the two pine species in our discussion. That's the same number we'd get if we subtracted the cardinality of cypresses 
from the cardinality of the conifer set. Is that true always? That the cardinality of the difference is, for all finite sets, equal to the difference of the cardinalities? I'm not going to tell you the answer to that one. Convince yourself whether it's true or not. If you think it is, you should be able to give an informal argument why. If not, show that it is false by coming up with a counterexample. That is, sample sets A and B for which this doesn't work. And also, you should identify under what special circumstances for A and B that it does work, such as the example here has. For the last set concept, we'll start with something familiar. You all know from algebra the coordinate system for plotting points and curves in the real plane, sometimes called the Cartesian plane, after the mathematician and philosopher René Descartes. Story goes, probably not true, that Descartes first hatched this idea by watching a fly walking on a ceiling. The insight is that we can analyze the fly's position by decomposing it into its horizontal and vertical positions. These two one-dimensional values together capture the fly's two-dimensional position. And that is how we get the idea of a point in a plane being a pair. So what is a pair like this? It's an object with two parts, each part itself being a real number. The news today is that we can generalize this and talk about ordered pairs where the components are drawn from other sets, not just real numbers. When we say ordered pair, we mean two things where it is well defined which one is the first and which one is the second. We denote an ordered pair by enclosing the two things in parentheses and separating them with a comma. The set of ordered pairs where the first thing in each pair is drawn from a set X and the second from Y is called the Cartesian product of those sets, X and Y. Moreover, Cartesian products can be for more than just pairs. You can have triples, quadruples, etc. In general, we call these things tuples, or for a specific number of components, N, N tuples. Here's an example of using a Cartesian product to capture an everyday idea. Suppose we have a paper doll set like the one shown here. As you may have guessed, I have a young daughter. Suppose we have three tops available, four things in the pants and shorts and skirts category, and two pieces of headwear. These make three sets. An outfit for our doll, then, is an ordered triple drawn from these sets, a top, a bottom, and a piece of headwear. The set of all outfits is the Cartesian product, the Cartesian product of the set of tops, the set of bottoms, and the set of headwear. As you read the section and do the exercises, you should begin to notice Cartesian products all around you, uh, not only in math, but in everyday life as well. Exercise 1.9.11 talks about viewing items in a cafeteria as a Cartesian product, as an example. As a final note, remember that as we explore mathematical ideas, one part of our exploration is modeling these concepts when programming in ML. In the case of Cartesian products, this task is done for us. Cartesian products are already supported in ML using the same notation as in math. Note how the ML interpreter reports the types of these expressions. Just as in math, we call these values tuples. Each tuple value, or tuple expression, has a type, a tuple type. And you can see the, no the notation for expressing tuple types is consistent with the way that we would denote a set uh, that is a Cartesian product in mathematical notation. This has been a quick introduction to cardinality, disjointness, partitions, and Cartesian products, and an informal one at that. We'll be getting back to these to make formal definitions and to use these in proofs and more complicated definitions. Your present task is to make sure you have a feel for what these things mean. In the next video, we'll turn back to ML 
and look at features that allow us to define our own sets and operations on those sets.